welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. My name is Michael Camilleri. I direct the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law program here. Um, we're really happy all of you could join us today uh, for a conversation with Minister Maria Fernandez Spinoza to discuss her candidacy for OAS Secretary General. Um, six weeks from now, I think as, as most of you know, 34 member states of the OAS will elect a Secretary General from among three candidates. Um, this Secretary General will serve for the next four years. Obviously, it's a critical post at a very challenging time for the region on many fronts. And today's event kicks off uh, a series of conversations we will be having for the three can with the three candidates uh, for the post. Um, so our goal for this initiative really is to get to know these candidates, to understand where they're coming from, how they view the region, how they see the OAS, uh, and what their aspirations would be uh, as Secretary General. Uh, so it's really a pleasure today to welcome uh, Minister Espinosa uh, is our first guest in this series. Um, she has a distinguished trajectory as a minister of uh, former Minister of Defense and on two occasions Minister of Foreign Affairs of her country, Ecuador. Um, she also served most recently as president uh, of the 73rd session of the UN General Assembly. Uh, so I'm sure we'll hear from you her how those experiences would shape her approach uh, to the post of the Secretary General. Uh, so the format here will be um, a conversation between the minister and myself. Uh, we'll do that um, for the next hour or so, and we'll leave time uh, for questions from, from you all uh, before we end at 10.30. So uh, I think with that, Minister, welcome once again. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump right into the conversation. Uh, I think maybe a good place to start uh, would be to ask you why you're interested uh, in being OAS Secretary General, uh, and what in your background and philosophy uh, distinguishes um, your approach uh, to to the uh, to the post. Okay. Buenos dias a todas y a todos. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Michael. Let me start by saying that I, I feel very honored to be here with you this morning, and very happy because. Uh, Inter-American dialogue has a great meaning for my country. Um, as you may know, uh, the Inter-American dialogue was created uh, in 1982 by two very prominent gentlemen, um, Mr. Saul Linowitz, um, and a U.S. diplomat and, uh, and uh, ambassador to the U.S., U.S. ambassador to the U.S., and an Ecuadorian a fellow Ecuadorian, former president of Ecuador, and former secretary general of the OAS, Galo Plazalazo. And I had the privilege to meet him uh, before he passed away. And um, they were the ones that teamed up uh, to establish this uh, space, this think tank for dialogue, for interaction, um, and, uh, and I think it means uh, a lot. It has uh, a very strong uh, symbolic uh, message in a way. So your question, Michael, is why um, instead of after a very successful year as president of the United Nations General Assembly and after you know, my more than 20 years of career to run uh, for candidate to the OAS, uh, honestly, my plans were very different. I really wanted to back, go back to academia, that's where I come from, uh, to uh, do some teaching, some learning, um, interact with young people, which I love to do. So these were my plans, but then um, there were several uh, heads of government uh, that approached me uh, to suggest that I might be a good candidate for a, a new new time at the OAS. And, um, um, these uh, were um, heads of government of uh, two very important Caribbean countries. They have uh, put forward my candidacy, as you know, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, and, of course, I, my candidacy was presented the very last day, the, the, the day of, of, the, of the closing of the deadline. And, um, and I, of course, made some consultations with uh, some countries to see what, uh, you know, were their uh, expectations on the OAS. And um, when I decided to accept, there were basically three reasons. The number one reason was that for me, 
it was a privilege and honor in an acknowledgement of my more than 25 years of career uh, from the Caribbean countries uh, to say that I could be, in a way, you know, somehow a representative of their interest in other vision of, their, of the OAS. And they do have great expectations on the OAS. Uh, and they do see the need to rebalance the four pillars of the OAS. And they do see that we have a, a pending account to come and bring together uh, in a holistic, interconnected way the four pillars that created the OAS. The human rights pillar, the democracy pillar, the integral development pillar, and the multidimensional security pillar in a balanced, interconnected, synergist, synergetic way, and um, with you know, very, very concrete proposals. And I thought that it was, there was, um, no, it is today, you know, perhaps the moment and the time to go back to the roots in a very, in a creative fashion. Go back to the roots, read again the charter, but, you know, at the same time, rejuvenate the OAS and transform it into an organization of the 21st century. An organization that would respond to the current challenges that the hemisphere is facing. And at the same time, I said the first reason, yes, because the, there is a sense of uh, the need to take the dust out of the OAS and, and rethink the organization going back to the roots and the founding charter. And the second reason was that the, the very fact that two Caribbean countries uh, suggested that I could be a candidate, it immediately made me think, you know, how important this sense of community, hemispheric community, is important. The idea of a, a citizen, a, a hemispheric uh, citizenship, a belonging, you no, know, uh, to a broader space than our own countries, the, the countries where we were born and and raised. Uh, was extremely important and also a very strong message. And the third uh, reason was because of my credentials and my experience. And modesty apart, but I think that I do have, you know, a professional and academic career that is uh, uh, really something uh, that, uh, you know, allows me to say I am a good manager. You know, I have you know, being in charge of, of the armed forces and the military in my country. Uh, I have been foreign minister twice. I have been a public servant for a long time. But also, I have had the privilege to preside over the, the United Nations General Assembly, which is at the universal level, the highest elected post that we have. And I was able to uh, establish a respectful dialogue constructive consensus building at the UN in very difficult times. Good manager, a good um, capacity to bring together uh, different positions, different views, and extract the common denominators. And in and, and, uh, and the third reason, in a, not one that we should take for granted, I think that after 71 years, it is about time to have a female, um, to have a woman, you know, take the lead of uh, the most important hemispheric political platform. But not any woman. I'm not an essentialist just because you're a woman. No, no, I'm saying I am a woman with the credentials, the experience, the drive, and the commitment to bring this multilateral space to life and reflect the interests and the priorities of the 34 countries that are members of the organization. So um, between the teaching and the research and writing my own books, I think that the commitment to serve was strong.
Terrific. Thank you, Minister. I think that, that gives us a lot of uh, areas to, to explore in this conversation. Um, let me pick up on, on one thing, which is um, this idea of kind of rebalancing among the pillars of the OAS and trying to, to kind of cover the four, the four thematic pillars. Um, the reality is that while the OAS is um, the preeminent hemispheric organization, I think, um, it, you know, especially now, some of the, the sub-regional entities that have emerged and as, as competition in the view of some have sort of faded from prominence. Uh, the OAS, if anything, is more um, more prominent than perhaps was in the last five or ten years, um, and has a normative and institutional framework that's really unmatched. Uh, but it's a small organization with a budget of less than $100 million a year. I don't know what the UN's budget was, but I imagine it was... Uh, Three billion. Three billion. billion. So this well, is that's the core funding only. You know, we're not counting on the, the agencies, the specialist programs, etc. And, uh, and, and I was on, on, on top of that. So, so we're dealing with a, you know, by by the standards of international organizations, a fairly uh, a fairly small organization. One of the critiques has been that the OAS tries to do too much with too little, that it's spreading itself too thin, and that it actually should be focusing on those areas where it has a, a distinct comparative advantage. So I wonder what your view is on, um, you know, the sort of rebalance and, 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 and covering these four thematic pillars, but doing so in an environment where human resources, financial resources are thin, um, and there is this critique that the, U the OAS has suffered by trying to do too much with too little. I think that it's a very, very good point, uh, Michael, because uh, it's true. Uh, when you look at the $82.7 million budget of the OAS, when you look at the mandates, you know, you go like, oh my God. I mean, the OAS, uh, you know, has been doing magic this, because, uh, you know, if you match the amount of, of resources with the mandates, there is a, a clear mismatch. It is obvious because, um, and I have followed and studied the mandates. So in 2016, there's a huge effort, you know, undertaken by member states to prioritize and mainstream the mandates. 2016, uh, close to, uh, uh, I think 2000, I, I wrote it down so I won't forget, but I think that um, there were 2,000 mandates in 2016, pretty much. And uh, I have it written down, so I give you the, the exact numbers. But, um, well, never mind. I'll come back to that. But in anyhow, let's say 2,000 mandates, uh, training and mainstreaming and prioritizing. Uh, we ended up with 80-something, 80 80-something 80 mandate, which is, I think, manageable. It's not about numbers, it's, it's about quality, but I'm trying to give you, uh, you know, uh, a, a general overview. And after the General Assembly in Medellin, we went back to close to 600 mandates. And when I ask, because basically what I have done these weeks since I presented my candidacy, um, is to listen and to speak to a lot of heads of state, heads of government, foreign ministers, civil society, academia. I have spoken to hundreds of people these weeks. And basically what I hear over and over again is budget is too small. We have problems with budgets. Uh, my question was, why is that we do not, uh, we, we, uh, we stop short in exploring and, and doing more in the terms, in, in, for example, in the area of multidimensional security, which has a lot of success stories. You know, this, this multilateral assessment mechanism, which is this peer review mechanism uh, for drug trafficking and the drug problem. Why is that we don't do more? Because it, it is a very important area. And they say, well, there is a budget challenge. So we do have budget challenges and budget <coughs> constraints. And, and, and I said, why is that we don't do more on the development pillar? The development pillar uh, receives less than 10% of the OAS budget. And here we're, we're speaking about eight or nine million dollars per year, but the mandates are huge. You know, and you have entire uh, bureaucratic structures dealing at the multidimensional development secretariat 
it's a big name. But then, you know, they have $8 million for 34 countries. So what I'm trying to say is that the uh, financial challenge is not the problem. It is the symptom. And the symptom reflects a lack of clarity in vision and priorities. If you have clarity in vision and priorities, I think that the financial support comes after. And I do understand that there are assessed contributions from member states. I do know that there is uh, a commitment to rebalance the contributions to the OAS, which I think is very healthy. You know, that is going to uh, really mean that some countries have to pay more, more in terms of, of the total amount, and other countries should, you know, even out their contributions to diversify responsibility uh, and ownership as well, which I think is very healthy. So, let me just ask you, what, what would your be, what would be your vision and priorities within that framework? Okay. And, and on the development piece particularly, I mean, some have argued $7 million for 34 countries. I mean, why the new development? The IDB has a budget of $13 billion. So, I mean, should, should the OAS be in the development business if we're dealing with such, such small uh, sums of money? Yes, I, I, I think that, um, well, that, that is the assessment that, that I have made. And, uh, and basically, uh, when I say, well, what, what is the vision? We have to go to come back to the um, OAS uh, uh, charter. And, and I think that, and the OAS has produced a vision. And just for our consumption, I think it is very healthy to reread the things that, as member states, we have agreed upon. And let me, if you allow me, Michael, I would like to share the vision for the OAS, which I 100% um, adhere, 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 exactly. No? And, and, and I'm going to take you the license to read this to you, because it is extremely important that we go back to the roots. And quote, the OAS is the hemispheric political forum inclusive for all the countries of the Americas committed to the strengthening of democracy, the promotion and protection of human rights, the advancement of integral development, and the fostering of multidimensional security, all equal and interdependent, with justice and social inclusion for the benefit of the peoples of the Americas. So, I'm saying we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we, we do need to go back to the commitments that we have made. This is, you know, this is like a, a, a Bible, sorry for the metaphor, but this is what we have agreed to as member states, and we have to go back to this. You say, what are your priorities? My priorities is to listen to the priorities of member states, which I have been doing already. And what I can tell you is, uh, I, I have heard, you know, what can you do with uh, $8 million for the development pillar? Not much. But at the same time, I have heard, believe me, half of the members of the OAS saying, we want more development and we want the OAS to deliver on the development pillar. What we need to do is identify what is the value added of the OAS in working in the development pillar. What is that the OAS can do that others cannot do? And that is the kind of exploration, and that is the kind of proposal that I'm bringing. In my opinion, and in listening to key actors is that the OAS has to be the intelligence engine for development, sort of a clearinghouse to identify what are the initiatives, the ongoing efforts, the pockets of potential financing. And there are, there are issues that are irreplaceable in the, in the development pillar, and that the OAS can do and should do. For example, climate change. Climate change it is, is a survival issue for the Caribbean countries and the coastal countries 
of our hemisphere? What is the value added that the OS can bring to the climate discussions? Intelligence gathering, clearing house on best practices, both on mitigation and adaptation, <coughs> no? Uh, how can we strengthen the capacities of some countries to access climate finance? I was part of the putting together of the Green, uh, green Climate Fund. And I have asked leaders from the Caribbean, how much money have you received from the Green Climate Fund? None. None because there is a capacity issue. Some have a little bit, but there is a capacity issue. There is a connection gap there uh, to access the, the incredible potential and possibilities of, of the climate finance world. And I have to be honest with you, as president of the UN General Assembly, I was speaking daily with heads of state of government around the world. I was participating in the peace summit in, in Paris and the climate negotiations here and the, uh, the dialogues on multilateralism and international governance and rule of law, um, academic discussions of the, of the International Court of Justice, etc. And I didn't see a hemispheric voice there with the big players. And that's also something that I can bring to the audience. My networks, the connections, the possibility of being in the big spaces where leaders of the world meet and take decisions on important matters. Not only on development, but I, I put the example of climate change. But let me talk about refugees and migration. The OES is the only space where uh, we can have a constructive dialogue on best practice, preventive approaches, the combat against human trafficking, where you know the US and Canada in Latin America and the Caribbean are together to discuss the critical issues. Because every country, every, every member country of the OAS is either a country of origin, <coughs> of transit, or destination, or the three at the same time. So that is the proper platform to discuss uh, migration issues. And you know, in my modest opinion, it should be also the space to think collectively and creatively about preventive approaches to migration. Just to cite two of the examples of the, of the development pillar. So um, I think this idea of saying rebalance, um, harmonize, find synergies, it's, it's real. Because uh, I, I have heard, you know, why do development with $8 million? It's because we haven't been smart enough. We, we uh, in, in fundraising on the critical issues for the entire membership of the OAS. On the security pillar, there are so many good practices that we have, you know, innovations. Again, this uh, multilateral assessment mechanism, uh, the plan to combat uh, human trafficking, uh, the plan uh, on, on um, um, illegal arms trade. I mean, there are a series of efforts that gather support and consensus within the organization. So not only to rebalance the four pillars and identify the value added, but also to, to build collectively uh, a positive agenda on the things that unite the members of the OES. My slogan is united in diversity, and it can be done. I have proven that I can do it among 193 member states at the UN. I think it can be done at the OES, and the OES is in need of things that unite uh, the member states uh, and heal the polarization, the division, and the lack of communication. That's great. Let me let me pick up right there because um, you have, I think, uh, in this conversation and some of the interviews you've you've given, um, emphasized your um, capacity for consensus building and your experience, especially at the UN. Um, doing that. Um, I think we would all agree that uh, the consensus is desirable. Um, the, the challenge at the OAS has been that in a very polarized hemisphere, um, the search for consensus uh, sometimes leads to either paralysis or kind of lowest common denominator outcomes. Um, I mean, even the issue of climate change, which you just mentioned, which is existential uh, for some of the countries uh, in the region, 
you have the presidents of the two biggest countries in the region who are climate change deniers. Um, so in, in a context where you have a very sharply polarized view about some, some pretty fundamental issues, how do, you, how do you envision trying to build that consensus? Well, first of all, Michael, I, I think that uh, to build consensus doesn't mean paralysis and doesn't necessarily mean a minim, minim, minimum common denominators. It does mean agreement on the fundamentals. And here we are, you know, facing, again, an issue, issues of principle. Uh, you say that there are countries that are climate deniers, but there are countries, the majority of them, you know, that they, they're looking for uh, critical issues such as access to climate finance, resilience building, technology transfer, special low carbon technology transfer, and these are issues that can be done. And I, 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 I can tell you, I've been part of climate negotiations for 20 years or more. It can be done. And consensus doesn't mean necessarily unanimity. And we know that. That's why our multilateral systems should be also adapted to process dissent for the sake of the majority. I mean, this is something that uh, it's part of the rules of the multilateral system. The critical issue here is what I promise to do, and I have done during my entire life, is whatever decision we take collectively, and my role as Secretary General has to be in strict compliance with international law with inter-American law, because we have done a lot in terms of jurisprudence and law and regulation creation. It's a huge body of, 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 of uh, capital, a juridical capital. I don't know if you can say that in in, in <coughs> you know, And in compliance with the rules and procedures of the organization. Tidiness in the way we take decision is extremely important. And, um, and of course, I'm saying unity in diversity. One of the most difficult issues, and that has been my experience, is to process dissent in a respectful manner and in accordance to international law. So common denominator doesn't mean necessarily lowest common denominator. Whether you speak about multi-dimensional security issues and the enormous effort and, and in track record of the OES in, in um, Seguridad Pública, public security and, and, and training, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, the, the track record on the other uh, issues I, I, I mentioned, uh, the Convention Against Corruption, uh, the Convention uh, Against Drugs and, and, the, drug, and the Drug Problem, um, international organized, uh, organized crime, terrorism. I mean, there's a huge you know, wealth of of, of, uh, of normative um, efforts and, and decisions and, and jurisprudence that exist uh, out there. So um, I think that there is the possibility of making the difference in going one step ahead uh, in uh, agreeing on the fundamentals uh, and agreeing on the fundamentals and consensus doesn't necessarily mean unanimity. Um, I want to turn to a couple of specific issues that you would likely um, be tasked with, uh, with addressing if you were uh, elected Secretary General. Uh, and some of these will not be um, new to you in terms of uh, you know, the issues that have been raised um, as you run for this position. Um, and the first one is Venezuela, uh, which um, obviously is, is the, probably the issue that's occupied um, most of the OAS's time in, in recent years. You've been uh, somewhat critical of Secretary General Almagro in terms of his uh, kind of hyper focus on, on Venezuela, um, and in your view, um, the way that has sort of polarized and divided uh, the organization. Um, but I think it's safe to say that just given the gravity of the crisis and especially its regional spillover effects, you mentioned the issue of migration and refugees, that this issue is not going away uh, in general and it's not going away for the OAS. So I think it's worth taking a bit of time to explore how. Uh, your approach might differ from the current Secretary General on that uh, issue in particular. Um, 
the, the OAS has um, not, you know, putting sort of the Secretary General aside, the member states have um, invoked the Inter-American Democratic Charter, um, concluding that there was an, an alteration of the democratic order in Venezuela, um, a, a, a specifically related to separation of powers and usurpation of the functions of the National Assembly. Um, the member states have sat uh, as the official representative of Venezuela, uh, the representative of Juan Guaido. They recognize Juan Guaido as the legitimate interim president of, uh, of Venezuela. What is your view on the, um, uh, the compliance or lack thereof of Venezuela with the Inter-American Democratic Char Charter, and, and, and who is the legitimate president of Venezuela in, in your view? I would start by the last part of your question, because um, I, I think that you have shared already what have, you know, has been uh, my opinion on that. And, and I think you're quite right. Number one, I think that the Venezuela crisis has taken the majority of the political energy of the OAS in recent years. Um, we acknowledge, and I think we all acknowledge, uh, that uh, there is a situation of, of crisis in, in Venezuela and that it deserves attention. There is no doubt about that. We need to devote time and pay attention to the situation of, of, of Venezuela but to the um, difficult situations that several countries of the, regions, uh, of the region are undergoing. Perhaps the issue of Venezuela is the, the, the more, the longest uh, uh, crisis that we have had to face in the recent years. There are other, um, you know, situations in, in the hemisphere that should also concern and can make uh, our efforts. Um, the second issue is uh, not only that it has taken uh, the largest uh, amount of energy, but it has polarized the positions of member states. Um, in polarizing, I think that more and more you alienate some countries and more and more it is difficult to reach consensus, even if consensus does not mean unanimity. My question to you would be, have we succeeded in addressing the Venezuela crisis? What are the, um, the uh, success stories that we can share on Venezuela and say, well, we have achieved this? And I believe and I have said that several times, that there is a need for a refreshed look to the Venezuelan crisis. And uh, um, countries have said, the majority of countries have said, that there is an urgent, urgent need to operate under, you know, the key tool that diplomacy has, which is dialogue. And the word dialogue can be used, you know, as, a, uh, as an easy outlet to say, oh, yeah, that dialogue here and dialogue there, and that said, that's a very easy way to say we are going to solve this situation with dialogue. Yes, it's a generic approach to say dialogue, but it's the only tool that diplomacy has. Otherwise, let's look at the, uh, the El Pacto de Bogotá, the, the Bogotá Pact, or any other international instrument on dispute resolutions. And I think that what we need to do is to rebuild, create an, a new architecture for dialogue for the Venezuela case. Uh, I have given a lot of thought to this. And it's, what do you think? Who is the, 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 the true, you know, uh, legitimate representative? Uh, is this A or B? And what is, uh, it's, it's not a multiple choice exercise, Michael. It's much more difficult. And what I can tell you is that it is not useful to have a secretary general that is so opinionated on any, anything. You know, that acts 
with principle that acts in close compliance with international law and the procedures of the organization. But I think that the final decisions on any issue, in particular complex and, and, uh, and controversial issues, should be in the hands of member states. Um, you're, you can, uh, you're going to see me, hopefully, in action as being strong, as having leadership, but you will never see, you know, what is my personal take on things, because I don't think it's relevant, and that is not the role of the Secretary General. Um, I have come up with a series of scenarios, of possibilities on, 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 uh, on Venezuela. They have to be discussed with the member states themselves, and I think that we should learn from past experience, because it's not only the OAS, we have ad hoc groups that have been formed to address the issues. The other candidate, Mr. Gesella, was you know, one of the uh, leading actors of, of, of the Lima group, but there is the group of contact, the participation of the European Union, an initiative that was, uh, um, uh, you know, that happened under the auspices of Norway that then took place in Barbados. There are so many efforts that are out there not to address the Venezuela issue that we cannot continue to repeat the same thing and expect a different outcome. That's the whole point. And the only tool you have, the raw material we have, is dialogue. The key, the key, the, 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 the magic bullet here is how you go about dialogue. What is your roadmap? Who are the actors of the dialogue? What are the steps you are willing to take and the risks? And this, I think, should be the subject of our honest, transparent, creative, and constructive conversation among member states of the OAS. And the role of the Secretary General is a role of broker, of bridge builder, of convener, advisor of member states. That's how I see. And I know, because I'm not naive, and we all look at the, at the, at the um, social media. Uh, and they say, oh, no, this person, you know, she, uh, the issue of Venezuela. Yes, I think that we have to be honest and we have to be um, realistic on this issue and learn from past experience. And, and, and believe me, I have a, a group of, the nice part of, about my campaign is I have a, lo a lot of volunteer persons working with me, supporting and helping, especially young professionals. And we are doing a serious research, an ethnography, or what has happened with all the different efforts on the dialogue regarding Venezuela. And I think that we owe to the Venezuelan people to come up with something that would be, you know, uh, outcome oriented and for the benefit of the Venezuelan people. I agree, 4.5 million people have left Venezuela. This is not a minor issue, and we have to be responsible. But I think that the approach should be different. Constructive, okay, realistic, creative, and we have to learn from past experience. I want to just drill down on this a little bit, because I think people are very interested in, in sort of understanding how you would approach these issues, um, both Venezuela and, and, and potentially similar challenges. Um, I take your point that, that you want to sort of depersonalize these issues, and I think you said, you know, not not um, not express your own sort of opinion about these these sorts of situations, but also um, you made the point that you want to act in a, in a principled fashion. Um, one of those principles, very clearly, at the OAS is this commitment to democracy. It's, it's unique. It's the Inter-American Democratic Charter provides that the people of the Americas have a right to democracy. Their governments have a duty to provide it. That's a a unique. Uh, kind of international law formulation within the, the context of this specific regional organization. So I, I guess the question is, how do you how do you square those two things in a in a situation where a country is in sort of gross and flagrant violation of that commitment, where it is undermining separation of powers, where it's uh, engaging in fraudulent elections, where it's systematically violating human rights, as, as Michelle Bachelet and others have, have found in the case of Venezuela? How do you, as Secretary General, do you remain neutral? Do you main, do you, do you not? Um, is your role to sort of stand back and let the member states speak to the 
the Democratic Charter, or do you lead in a principled fashion and call out violations where they where they exist? How do you, you know, that that tension between um, taking the personalization out of it, but also acting in a in a principled fashion in defense of the uh, the pillars and the in the, the normative framework of the organization? How do you how would you approach that as Secretary General? Well, I think the first thing is to remind ourselves that the role of the Secretary General is one of uh, an advisor to member states. But the best way to advise member states is with impartial, accurate information uh, to work something where I think the OAS should have a comparative advantage, which is a conflict resolution body and which is uh, an um, early warning, an early warning mechanism not only for the Venezuela case, because perhaps we wouldn't be facing the current situation, but early warning, um, red lights to member states, informing constantly member states that there are situations that might evolve in, in, in a direction that is not desirable according to the OAS uh, principles and charter. And in this case, you say, oh, you sit back. I don't think that uh, just uh, to provide accurate, timely information uh, and defend the principles of, of the charter, uh, it's, 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 uh, it can be called to sit back. And I think that there is a big difference between principles and, and, and uh, ideology or personal, uh, or, or personal approaches or takes on certain situations. And sometimes, I think that the role of the OAS is uh, to bring water to the fire and not to bring gasoline to the fire in a way. And, and honestly, uh, uh, there are instruments and mechanisms that are there. Uh, one of the most powerful um, uh, architectures that the OAS has built over the years is its human rights architecture. Uh, both the commission and the court, I think it is irreplaceable. And uh, the human rights instruments that we have crafted together are extremely, are pioneer. Um, they have ex uh, enormous weight. And I'm saying this because I was the ambassador of Ecuador to, to, the, to Geneva. I was a member of the Human Rights Council. And a lot of uh, jurisprudence is taking uh, from the inter-American uh, body of, of uh, an archi a human rights architecture of the inter-American system. So uh, we do have the means, we do have the structures, we do have the mechanisms uh, in place. And, and I think that we have to be responsible, impartial. Uh, when a secretary general speaks, uh, it has to be because uh, it has clarity about, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the the voice, the narrative, and the position of the member states of the organization. And uh, we, we have to be very careful with words. And I'm saying very careful with words because when I say something, I do it. I'm a poet, and I know what is the transformative power of words. Uh, and, and, and sorry, I'm, I'm derailing a little bit on the conversation, but uh, you, you know, I campaigned to be elected president of the General Assembly, and I said, I have seven priorities for my tenure. Seven priorities. I didn't invent the priorities. I spoke with more than 100 countries to identify the priorities, and I delivered on all the seven priorities. I signed a, an, an oath of office, and I propose to do so. I have written already a code of ethics for the performance of the Secretary General. That I didn't invent the will myself. I, 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 um, I took these principles from the charter itself, from article which I invite you to read, article 118 of the charter. No conflict of interest, no personal opinions, uh, no mandates for any state uh, in particular, but from all the member states. And, and I think this, these issues may seem perhaps redundant because it is obvious, but I think that they have to be written. And, uh, and if I'm saying, which I am saying, I will not run for re-election. I will not run for re-election. I'm saying this right now. It means that I will not run for re-election. We'll stop. That's the way I have been doing things my entire adult life. 
and, and, and I think it has uh, weight, weight and power. Uh, I'm glad you raised the Inter-American Human Rights System and, and uh, gratified to hear your, your strong endorsement of that system. Um, I did want to, um, just on your, your point about sort of an early warning system under the Inter-American Democratic Charter, uh, a little bit of uh, advertisement for this report on, uh, on the OAS called Rebuilding Hemisphere Consensus, which hopefully you all saw when you came in, but precisely one of the recommendations uh, in this report from last year is to, to build uh, an early warning system under the Charter uh, to hopefully prevent the, the, the future of Venezuela. Um, on the inter-American human rights system, I think you rightly observed that this is really a jewel in the crown of the OAS, uh, a system that's uh, respected for its independence, for its effectiveness, for its, uh, its professionalism. Um, that's not always well received uh, by governments um, uh, for, those, for those same reasons. One of the governments that, that took issue with the system, as you know well, was the government of Bahia Korea. Uh, on issues, especially of freedom of expression. I know you were not uh, foreign minister at the time that this was happening. You were in the cabinet. So I'm just interested um, in you know, whether you had any exposure to those issues, whether you had an opportunity to weigh in as the, the, the government of Korea, this was 2011, 2012, 2013, launched the campaign to try to weaken, especially the, the rapporteurship on freedom of expression and some of the functions of the inter-American system in response to some critical uh, opinions and decisions that were coming out of the, the system at the time? Well, I, I think that, um, yes, indeed, I was part of the cabinet, but I, I didn't take part on, on these uh, decisions. What I can tell you is that I was uh, the uh, uh, permanent representative of Ecuador uh, to the UN in Geneva, that I was uh, acting as a full member of the Human Rights Council. And um, I would just invite, oh, you know, it's boring, perhaps you don't want to do it, but please uh, do listen to my speeches and my approach uh, to the system. And uh, it is not a secret that um, I have been criticized and not supported by the former president, precisely because we have difference of opinion, and this is perhaps one. Um, I, my commitment to human rights uh, starts, you know, more than 30 years ago. I'm known as a as a human rights um, basically person. Uh, I have worked my entire professional career, for example, even in crafting uh, the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm well known uh, for my commitment to the rights of Indigenous Peoples. I have struggled my entire life for the empowerment uh, of women. I have worked you know, my entire career, one of the uh, of the jewels of my tenure as president of the General Assembly was an initiative called Women in Power, uh, you know, to really foster and strengthen the political participation of, of, of women in spaces of decision making. This is well known. Um, I have had a long standing commitment on the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, my work on the rights of persons with disabilities has been acknowledged and, and recognized uh, worldwide. Uh, so this is uh, really not, not new to me, uh, the, the work on human rights defenders. I am a person that not only comes from academia, but also from civil society, the work of civil society organizations. Uh, I also work on intergovernmental bodies that look at uh, rights, uh, environmental rights in a way. You know, I have, uh, it's not a secret, it's on my CD, but perhaps uh, 10 years of my life working for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, IUCN, and my, my role was precisely very much connected to the rights of indigenous people. So this is really not something that I'm trying to oh, uh, bring because I'm campaigning. This has been part of, part of my DNA my, my entire life. And uh, um, I have come with uh, seven points to improve the management of the organization, and perhaps we should put, you know, a highlight there because I'm, I'm very worried, very worried about uh, the, the managerial health of, of the OAS. I'm also putting forward 10 thematic priorities uh, for the work of the next five years. Um, I, I'm taking very seriously in, in really shaping and, and finalizing a, a program of work. So this is a, a, a serious matter and uh, Usually when you're a woman, it's funny, but just take a look, especially for young women that, uh, women that are here. Um, when, 
you're a man, uh, you know, you're called your name, your last name, and perhaps your profession. Uh, Mr. XY is a diplomat, he's etc. When you're a woman, uh, the, no, the, the number of adjectives of uh, epithetos we say in Spanish that they use for you, it's funny, because it's not you. You know, I am Maria Fernandez Espinosa. I have my credentials, I have my career, uh, I have had my commitments for the past 30 years uh, of my life. But then it's, it's, you are in this side or you're in this side and they label you all the time. That's why I see myself on, on, on the social media and say, oh my goodness. And they put, they use in Spanish, even, it's even easier, no? You are, uh, and they qualify you. And it's not you, uh, your professional credentials, but then the qualifications that come with you because apparently uh, you, you cannot have your own um, uh, positions on things or, or, or your own trajectory on some, some things. And, um, and, and, and I think that's why we're here. We, we have to continue with, with the struggle uh, we have to continue to to really show that uh, we are here and sitting here in this dialogue because we deserve to be in positions uh, of that, uh, you know, that importance and, 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 and uh, with the possibility of really serve, uh, serving and, and contributing to our more uh, robust, uh, transparent, efficient and modern OAS. We'd all agree on that and I hope you referring to you as minister is, uh, is, is an appropriate way to, to have this conversation. Well, yeah, not anymore, but you know, I love to be called by my name. Uh, that's uh, good enough. You, you've earned the title, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue to use it if that's okay. Um, maybe a, a good place to end, and then I want to open up to questions, is the precisely the issue you mentioned, um, the, the kind of managerial health of the organization. Um, it's been an issue for a long time. Uh, uh, what is your assessment? Uh, you've had a lot of conversations with missions to the OAS, uh, professionals who work with the OAS. What's your assessment of the, um, the state of the kind of operation uh, at the organization, and, and uh, what is your your agenda on that front? Well, uh, the the truth is that in looking at the um, the administrative and financial health of the organization, I think that there is a a, a lot of space for improvement. Um, and uh, uh, the first thing, uh, I, 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 I believe that the mandates and the priorities have to be on top of how you design the organization and not the other way around. And, and uh, I think that we need to put in place mechanisms, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but mechanisms for accountability, for transparency, for good communication. I have to be very honest with you, if you go to the website of the OAS and look at some of the initiatives and programs, you don't see updates since 2016, 2017, as some of the issues are unfinished, the information is not in the same place. Just task yourselves with saying, what is the budget for this year of the OAS? Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, bits and pieces here and put the things together and then understand that yes, that is the 82.7, it's the core funding, but then, you know, the observers, we haven't spoken about the observers, 72 countries are observers to the OES. What is their role, their potential, how they can be uh, more involved and connected to the work of the OES, et cetera. Uh, don't, 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 I, I don't want to, I, to lose focus, but uh, I, I think that uh, we need to do better work on communicating better, among member states within the secretariat, but also to the public, because the contributions that uh, member states make to the OES, it's public funding. So we need to be accountable. And the secretary general has to be accountable. We all have to be accountable to what we do. And uh, if you look at, for example, uh, personnel, the staff, 1,000 people, more or less, 1,000 people work for the OES. But then you discover that there are about 500 people that are hired under a different types of contracts, which, is, which are consultancy contracts, where there is no accountability, there is no possibility of member states to see what is the relationship between investment and outcome. And, you know, I, I have been a manager of 
a Ministry of Defense, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know very well that the planning, uh, the impact assessment, the accountability mechanisms are extremely important. And if we're talking about the most important hemispheric organization, uh, it is extremely important that we modernize the systems. Uh, we, I look closely to a project, for example, to modernize the software of, of the OAS and uh, the communication systems of the OAS. Uh, it's a 2018 project uh, that is unfinished and that requires more funding, but the funding is not there. So these are the kind of, of situations that I think that we should take a closer look. You can be a good political leader, but you have to be a good manager. And to be a good planner and a good manager, you need experience. And that is the sort of experience that I bring myself. So uh, you, you uh, ministerial positions are, are critical to that. But you need to be a good planner. Because, uh, you know, us, sometimes women, we tend to see things in a holistic way. You cannot have a, a proper good early warning system for potential political crisis, for example, if you don't have a good manage a management in-house. The other issue, what is the balance in geographical representation on staff? Is there gender parity policies within the organization, which I haven't seen myself? Um, perhaps there is more research that I need to do, but the first impression is, is that. So they, they are modern uh, tools uh, to, govern, like, to govern and manage organizations such as the OAS. And all these modern tools that I'm, uh, I'm uh, experience with. I, I plan to bring to the to the organization, modernize, refresh, and make it more transparent, uh, you know, improve the website, improve the connection between the OES and the audience and the public. Communication is critical in the 21st century. So there are so many things to do. They're all written by priorities, by areas of work. Three three uh, bodies of, of, of proposal. One is on the management and the modernization, rejuvenation of the organization, the, the, the managerial proposal. The second one is on the priorities for the program of work and the thematic priorities. And the number three is in the code of ethics and behavior <coughs> and, and, uh, and accountability of the Secretary General. So these are the three bodies that I'm proposing. And, um, and believe me, I, uh, I, I'm a doer. So uh, you, you have to be absolutely confident that what I am saying today, you know, in five years from now, you will come back and say, you could, because we are humans, you know, we, we, you can do this better or this better, but uh, I can assure you that you will see, you know, uh, you will see me in action. And, uh, and uh, well, sorry that you say, oh, well, that's arrogant. But I think that we have to be, you know, frank and, and say <laughs> what we think. So thank you. Perfect. Okay. I think we've we've covered uh, a lot of ground, a lot of issues. Obviously, there's a lot more issues we could have covered. So let's open the conversation. Hopefully, we'll get to, to touch on a few more of those issues. Let me just take these these three questions in front here. Please introduce yourself and keep your <coughs> questions brief. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a retired U.S. military colonel and also a graduate of the Inter-American Defense College, and I'm very happy that uh, we are addressing the issue of gender parity because um, we cannot have democracy if 50% are excluded, we can't have development if 50% are excluded, we can't have security if 50% are excluded, we can't have human rights if 50% are excluded. and. Um, I can certainly tell you that when I was a, a student at the Inter-American Defense College, I was the only woman in a military uniform. And this is an Inter-American Defense College from, from uh, Canada down to Chile, out to Haiti, okay? And that's inexcusable. And so I ask that that be remedied. I also ask in terms of uh, the way that you're going to handle um, things, uh, for example, the UN, the UN Verification Mission to Colombia, for example. Thus far, the Secretary General of the UN has appointed only men to head the verification mission. 
And who does he appoint as the deputy? Every single time it's been a woman. So will you, uh, will you uh, act differently than the Secretary General of the UN? Thank you. Yes, I enjoyed your remarks, and I enjoyed this uh, analysis of the OAS. I thought it was very productive. I'm Rich Carson. I'm Rotary International's uh, representative of the Organization of American States. I've had that job since 2008. I've tried to improve my Spanish. I'm still learning. So, uh, but I had two questions for you. Number one, Daniel Ortega and Dick Robert, they agreed to human rights commission's observers there. And I think that was a big step for OAS, so I'd be interested in what your plan would be to have the federal government take a human uh, rights observer into the country from OAS. And the second question is, at the General Assembly, uh, the vote to expel Venezuela was 19 votes. You know, 34 countries, 19 votes. So do you have plans to evaluate introducing another resolution about Venezuela to the General Assembly? And if you do, do you uh, feel that you would have the um, uh, votes to make that resolution successful? Uh, I, my, my name is Agustin Echeverri. I'm from Colombia, and I'm doing my master, my LM International Legal Studies at Georgetown Law. Uh, I wanted to know your position about the, uh, what happened this week when uh, Maduro's regime decided to block the entry of the Inter-American uh, Commission for Human Rights to Venezuela. And what do you think, uh, you, I, I know you mentioned that dialogue would be the most important thing to solve the crisis for Venezuela, but I would like to know like, what do you think the, the role of the OAS should be in order to make that dialogue successful? Thank you. Three excellent Thank you. questions. Minister? Well, the, first, the first question on, on uh, gender parity, I cannot agree more with you. I mean, there is no possibility of thinking about sustainable development, democracy, or security if we do not include 50% uh, of the world's population. Um, regarding your, your concrete comment about uh, the UN, I have to tell you that um, I, I see a big difference because uh, I have worked hand in hand with the Secretary General and uh, we have to, to, to be confident. He's a, a true feminist. He has appointed all the high level positions of the UN have gender balance. Uh, it's, it's a matter of arithmetics. He has done a lot on that front. But not only about numbers, but about quality. Uh, I think that uh, the issue of uh, zero tolerance to sexual harassment, um, you know, huge campaign against violence and discrimination, that's not only the UN, it's happening at the domestic level. I have to say uh, that um, as Minister of Defense, I passed the first uh, gender parity and women empowerment policy for the armed forces in Ecuador, and I'm very proud to say that. I passed uh, a ministerial um, code uh, of, of uh, ethics for gender parity, gender, uh, gender um, women empowerment, and against uh, violence and discrimination in the di diplomatic corps at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, myself. So I, I think that uh, the, the current global, but also national atmosphere is pretty favorable. I think that we need to continue working on that. I have to tell you something. I haven't seen the OAS take active uh, a role and engagement in the commemoration of the Beijing Plus 25 um, um, action agenda. I'm part of the steering committee of Beijing Plus 25. We are working hard to this year. is the year of the commemoration of, of Beijing. There's a lot of movement. Uh, just came back from Chile, where I attended the uh, 14th conference on, on women for, for the region. Extremely vibrant, interesting, and this year is going to be the year of, 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 of women in a way. And I'm very much connected to, to, to that process. So I think that we are in good hands, and we do have, a, I, I, I say we do because we are all the United Nations, but we do have a feminist secretary general in a way. And there are things that needs to be, of course, uh, work more and uh, 
and we can always do better. But I think that we, the starting point is pretty positive. And your questions, um, very well taken on, on, on the role of Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Uh, I think that uh, in general terms, I think it is uh, the, the, the jewel of the crown, as you were saying, not only the, the commission, but also the, the court uh, and the rapporteurships that the system has and the jurisprudence and the conventions that we have created and the declarations we have in hand, there's a whole uh, architecture. And you say, well, uh, first uh, Nicaragua said yes, but then no, etc. cetera. And, and I think that the terms are, and conditions are extremely important. Uh, it is uh, critical to keep the independence, the neutrality of the commission, but also the good communication between the commission and the secretary general. Uh, I think that uh, we should, the starting point is to say, you know, the multilateral system is about respecting the sovereign equality among states, but also the sovereignty of states, except on the issues that we discussed before issues of principle and the mandates of the founding charter uh, of uh, the, the OES. What to do, what not to do, this is good or bad. I think that it depends very much on the particular situation. Uh, we have seen uh, social unrest in many countries of our region, unfortunately, and I think that we need to have a closer look. Um, I think we need to think seriously about this uh, uh, body of, of uh, of mediators, of experts that we act on call, you know, to uh, to uh, um, respond uh, to certain uh, critical issues. But the agreement of governments is is very important, and I'm responding to your question. You know, uh, I think that uh, if if we just say, oh, because we want to do it and we have to do it, but it doesn't work, the end result is not what we we, we would like to to see. So uh, I, I think we, we need to take the, um, the spotlight of the media on issues that are very sensitive and very critical. And to just use the human rights architecture sometimes in a silent, constructive, impartial way. And sometimes silence and careful approaches are more effective. That's what I can say. There is a lot that you can do without even being noticed. And sometimes, you know, quiet work uh, can be more effective. And agreement of member states are, uh, and, and acknowledgement of member states is of, of extreme importance. And sometimes, since we focus so much on country A or B, uh, we forget uh, the issue of precedent and, and principle. And, and really, who is that we are working for? we shouldn't forget who we are working for at the end of the day, is for the dignity and the well-being of the people of a certain country. Regardless, you know, who is the president, who, uh, if you acknowledge that this is the leader or this is not, uh, there is no mandate in the charter about defining who is good or bad, but the purpose and the end goal is to ensure that people in a particular country, you know, live peacefully and with dignity. And how to reach that goal, I think it requires a lot of careful handling of the tools that we have in hand. That is my, my, my really uh, honest assessment uh, on that. You know? And uh, you will never see me you know, as an opinionated person, but effective, yes. And I can tell you, effective, yes. And sometimes for that, you don't need the cameras, and you, know, you, you don't need to be in the spotlight. Um, regarding, um, oh, you, you asked concretely the question, are you going to bring a new resolution? Yet again, resolutions should come uh, with the wisdom and the advice of the Secretary General from member states. And the resolutions that are adopted either by the General Assembly or by the Permanent Council, which are the governing bodies of the organization, they are there, they represent uh, the will and the opinion of member states. The final question, I think, was should, should, the, should Venezuela allow the commission to visit? Well, again, I mean, am I entitled to say they should allow, they shouldn't allow? Yeah. What I'm saying is that 
for the commission to operate in full strength, you know, you, you need certain conditions. You need certain conditions. You, you, you need prior agreement. You know, it was so obvious what happened. It is very unfortunate that, you know, it means that the preparations, uh, the agreement, and the conversation wasn't there. So it is not on me to say it was good, it was bad, I agree, I disagree. That's where the problems start in something, in sometimes, not only sometimes, but when you have to face difficult, contentious situation, it's much better to take them out of the spotlight and of the media and to, in order to be more effective. I want to take, I want to get three more questions in, so let me take this one right here, uh, Frank LaRue and Christina. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your remarks. My name is Renata uh, Cini Montero, I'm from Mexico, and I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins Science. And I would like to ask you about another issue that recently created a lot of controversy within the region, and it's related to the one of the pillars you're, uh, you said you're going to enforce, which is the one of security, and it's uh, was the TR, the Inter-American uh, Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, and I would like to hear your your perspective on that. If that's the correct assessment to deal with the security issues within the region, do you propose a different approach, or I, I don't know, I don't want to hear your opinion. Thank you very much. Let's go. <laughs> My name is Frank LaRue and I work for Funda Medios in the Washington DC office. Uh, I'd like to ask you, I was very pleased to hear that you, you value as the most important element, as the, as the crown jewel, as Michael said, the inter-American human rights system. But I think I was particularly worried about the silent approach on human rights. Uh, I think there are moments for dialogue, yes, but keeping human rights silent is, is rather complicated. So I wanted to follow up on the question of freedom of expression. And the special rapporteurship on freedom of expression, which is one of the main elements of this, the jurisprudence and the, and the doctrine that the inter-American system has, has created. What would be your view on freedom of expression, and freedom of the press, and safety of journalists, which happens to be a serious problem in many of the countries of the, of the hemisphere? Thank you, Christina. My name is Christina Cerna. I spent many years with Michael Cohen OAS, I now teach at Georgetown Law School. Um, my question has to do with universality. The U.S. is the one founding member of the OAS that has not ratified the American Convention. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Antigua and Barbuda, the countries that have nominated you, are also not parties to the Convention. What will you do to seek greater adherence to this central document of the inter-American system? on the TI and, and what is your approach <laughs> again the, I mean the, it exists um, there are several countries that are parties uh, to this treaty and uh, it, uh, it, it has uh, uh, been in um, the SUSO as we say for a long time and uh, when it appears it creates a lot of uh, controversy and, and I think that uh, it is uh, one of the uh, of the um, um, corpuses of, of law that is part of the inter-American system in their different positions. There are several countries that are not parties uh, to, to the treaty. Um, I think that uh, the Pact of Bogota on, on peaceful solution of controversies uh, is uh, perhaps uh, more contemporary, brings a, a lot of uh, very useful uh, um, instruments, uh, uh, tools, uh, that uh, are perhaps more connected to, to what is happening in the 21st century. Uh, regarding Fundamedios, uh, I think that you, you this, uh, ask about freedom of expression. Uh, of course, I think that I am the living proof of the freedom of expression myself, because um, you know, as as a, as a woman in politics, uh, you get a lot of. Uh, in in I have always been um, so, um, uh, a freedom of expression 
uh, a defender, but in my practice, in my personal life, and, and I think that um, uh, the media have a, an extremely ro uh, important role to play uh, in, uh, in democracies, and especially uh, um, a role that has to be um, with great, great responsibility and, and great adherence to, uh, to, to truth and, and, and commitment to principle. And uh, I have had um, good and bad experiences, but it's, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter. I have been, you know, the li I am the living proof of, of freedom of expression. That is, that is a, that is a, a, a critical a component of uh, of, uh, of uh, a society that is peaceful and, and democratic. You ask uh, about security of journalists. That that is a critical issue. Um, I have experienced myself a very perhaps one of the hardest moments in my political career when uh, uh, three uh, Ecuadorian journalists were, were killed in Colombia. Uh, believe me that that was uh, perhaps one of the saddest uh, human situations I had to face. And I can only imagine what is the situations in countries where, uh, where uh, the killing of, of journalists is at the order of the day. Unfortunately, in our hemisphere, there are several countries where uh, uh, it has become sort of a, a, a practice, a daily life reality, and, and I think that there are international instruments, uh, both universal and, uh, and from the inter-American corpus of human rights, that uh, have to be put uh, you know, uh, in action, full-fledged, uh, to protect uh, the security of, of, uh, of journalists. And, um, I can say yes. I, I do have first-hand experience. I know, uh, you know, sometimes that you feel that, uh, you know, there, there's very little, especially if you're, um, if you're, uh, uh, como se dice, compatriotas, are outside of your own countries, uh, of your own country. It's, um, you know, it has been one of the most <coughs> terrible uh, human experiences that I had to face. Um, but uh, in, in, I think that we should all do everything that we have in hand to ensure safe environments for the work of, of journalists. Good journalism is critical to good democracy. And uh, your question about uh, universalizing the, uh, the uh, uh, human rights, the Inter-American Declaration of Human Rights, I think uh, you, you are right. It, it is, I think, uh, part of the, the awareness building, the, persuasion uh, process, uh, I think that um, it would be desirable that uh, every member state of the OAS subscribes uh, the Declaration on Human Rights. Um, the, the, the good side is that we have a universal body that is um, above, uh, which is the Universal Declaration on, on Human Rights uh, as well and the universal architecture. Universal meaning in world, worldwide, uh, which also uh, provides uh, a very strong um, engine and points of reference uh, on, on, on human rights issues. But of course, the ideal situation is, is to have uh, the uh, Inter-American Declaration being universally ratified by uh, all members of uh, the, uh, the OES. Great. Um, Minister, I want to thank you for, for being here, but especially for your willingness to engage in such a thorough and, and candid conversation and, and, and convey, I think, a lot of your background and vision uh, as you aspire to this, this critically important post for the Americas. So um, let's go ahead and thank the Minister. Um, I also want to thank your team for representing yourself. My team here with Captain Christie and, and others here at the dialogue. Just as a reminder, we are aspiring to host all three of the candidates. Um, Ambassador De Sela will be here in a couple of weeks, so look out for an invitation to that. And uh, you know, our, our objective with this is to, to really provide a platform for these candidates to tell us uh, where they're coming from and what they hope to do as Secretary General. So thank you again, Minister, for being here and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Inter-American Dialogue. And don't forget that one of the founders of this dialogue was Presidente Galo Blasalazo, an Ecuadorian, uh, a very distinguished Ecuadorian. So thank you for being here, and thank you, Michael, again, for this wonderful opportunity.